So good morning. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. I've been coming to Crestcom for a couple of years now, so to have the opportunity to, to come and talk to you about this tool is, um, uh, is great. So my name's Matt Lorenzen. Uh, I work for Trustwave Spider Labs. Uh, I'm a principal security consultant. Um, I've been doing this for quite a long time now, 20 years, I think. Uh, so the grey is starting to show. Um, I focus mainly on sort of red teaming and penetration testing at Spider Labs. Um, and I've delivered a lot of testing for uh, different organizations. And I think that's quite useful. It gives you a, a good insight into different um, networks, different approaches, different controls, et cetera. Uh, I'm a former check team leader. So uh, I, I've, I've done, delivered quite a lot of check work. Um, and before that, I ran my own company for a long time, and I think that was uh, probably one of the best things that I did early on in my career, to actually sort of get out there and try and sell uh, and understand what it is to sort of run a business at that scale. Uh, I've started talking quite a lot now, um, so I I've spoken at a few conferences. Um, I'll talk about Sheeple all the, all the time, probably too much, so hopefully you know, um, you you're going to enjoy this. So a quick overview of why this tool in the first place, you know, what the background was and how it came about. Some sort of ideas about network deployment, whether that's lab environments or actually in the real world. I'll give you an overview of how the tool works and why I think it's uh, the greatest thing ever. Uh, and then how you can sort of use it for practicing red teaming and sort of blue teaming and, and why that's uh, useful. And so for me, like, it came from a, an actual true need. Like, I was trying to upskill. Like, you know, we talk about this skills gap a lot, but there doesn't seem to be really much out there to support. Sure, there's lots of training labs, but you know, they have a very specific focus. And a lot of the time, we're trying to sort of explore new things that happen within the industry. You know, something will break, and you, and you need to sort of create representative environments that allow you to do that. Uh, and for me, I was trying to improve my tradecraft. At the time, I was focusing primarily on trying to become a better red teamer. And I wanted to explore all of those things. But I had nothing to bounce off. Um, and I was concerned because it was like I'm marking my own homework, right? So you write these tools and stuff, and, but you know exactly when something's going to happen. And, and that brings sort of a complacency into to the overall mix. Um, and it wasn't really effective. And this sort of concept of sort of practice makes perfect. You know, we want to improve our skill sets. But um, the problem with that is like self-directed learning is intrinsic to this, um, this industry. You know, if you're not the sort of person that is willing to, to push yourself forwards from a learning perspective, uh, personally, I think you're going to struggle. You, know, you have to be that person that's always willing to chase the carrot, but maybe not necessarily always get it. So I was looking at this, and you, know, you kind of want to build that tenacity in people that you know, they're prepared to smash into this brick wall um, and then dust themselves off and pick themselves up again. The problem with that is, like, how do you know that you're smashing into the right brick wall? So a good friend of mine you know, reminds me that you, know, you don't know what you don't know. So if you're talking about an efficiency of learning, we need these struggles and we need these opportunities to grow, but we also need them to be mindful of the fact that there's an end goal, which is to, to produce you know, more skill sets and, and improve that uh, where, where it's lacking. So I would argue that practice, perfect practice makes perfect. Um, and this, this is my favorite quote from Michael Jordan. So um, I'll read it verbatim. You can shoot eight hours a day, but if your technique is wrong, all you become good at is shooting the wrong way. And that's really good. You know, you can just become really good at doing the wrong things. So I was very mindful of that and, and really realized that there was um, sort of gaps in my knowledge that I wanted to, uh, to upskill. Um, I'm very interested in blue teaming as well. Like my, my original beginnings of my career was a system administrator. And I think a lot of that still is applicable. Um, I love, that's why I love purple teaming, you know, because it's without the ego and you actually get to fix things, which is quite nice. So um, I, I needed this sort of environment where I could uh, continue to grow. And it's because we tell our clients that we need to assume breach now. We've moved away from this uh, focus on the external perimeter and we know that everything is fine and what actually happens when somebody gets inside. You know, that's how we're now testing. And I think red teaming is very valuable for those sorts of things to actually test that. Uh, but the point is, like, can you see it? Do you actually see it happening within the network? You know, and what is the response to that sort of approach? And when you're thinking about tradecraft, you need to think about all this sort of stuff. If you're spawning a process, what does that look like? Can somebody have a response to that? And that's fine to see it, but do you, can you actually put out those fires? When everything's burning down, where is your focus within the context of the network? Do you even know what it is that you want to stop from burning down? And do you have the capability to sort of um, put all of your resources around the things that you're truly trying to protect whilst you're trying to maintain fires elsewhere within the network? 
And how long does it take you to do that? You know, this delta between initial discovery to response all the way through to some sort of containment, what does that look like? And I was very aware that I wanted to understand my actions on an endpoint and what they would lead to, what sort of logging that that would create, um, and how that would work. And traditionally, we've built these sorts of representative environments. I've been pushing this slide around for quite a while now. I've built these sorts of labs before. Um, I'm a big fan of Vios, which is an open source firewall routing solution. And it's the idea of trying to represent a sort of a corporate network so that we have these playgrounds, so to speak, places where we can explore this sort of stuff. Because professionally, I don't think it's always a good idea to be practicing the latest technique on a live customer network. So you know, we need to be training the way that we fight. They need to be representative of the world. They need to be representative of corporate networks. So I, I've done all this, and I really enjoy that because it's natural sort of system administration work. But there's always kind of a missing piece to this puzzle when I've been building these labs. First of all, they're very difficult to sort of build manually. Uh, so I have some projects around how I can automate that. But if you think about it, it's more than just a sort of a collection of uh, computers. Really, a network facilitates the communication between people. That's what we use the platforms for. And I didn't really find any way of sort of emulating end user behavior. Now, I, I stress, like sheeple, you can make good sheeple or bad sheeple. It's entirely up to you what your goal is. It's just a way of emulating user behavior. But when you expand that out into a tool which is maybe an assessment tool or a training tool for yourself, you know, the possibilities become uh, quite broad. So I read this study um, February last year, uh, Mark Smeets of Outflank fame. Um, and it's a really, it's a good read. It's quite dense. It focuses on all the opportunities that are out there for people to build their own lab infrastructures to explore these types of concepts. And Microsoft have got some great solutions. You know, they have some scripts that you can set up an Active Directory environment very quickly for. Um, but they highlighted this point that there's always one thing that's missing, and it goes back to this people issue that I've just mentioned. Um, you know, how do we replicate users uh, within that network so that we can work out how we can either defend against users that could be attacking or have users to attack so that we can develop tradecraft? That was the, that's the goal. So I kind of reflected on this for a while, and I realized that in some senses, you know, I've automated these sorts of problems before. Um, as I said, I, I used to be a system administrator, and one of the things that I used to do in my consultancy was deploy educational software for schools. And this stuff is like 1995, 1998. It's part of the national curriculum, so you can't say you can't have it. But you know, if you tried to put an installation wrapper around it, everything would break. It would expect specific things in specific places. Uh, and it was very manual. And that was the only real way that you could deploy this software. Um, and when you scale it up to 1,000 machines, like, sure, I'm self-employed, right? I can't turn away work. I'll happily walk around and do that. But the prospect of doing that for a couple of weeks was you know, watching my soul drain from my, my uh, body. So I, I sort of reflected on this. And the way that I solved that was I used uh, uh, the, ch the challenges for that are where you, when you try and do these wrappers and you put software around it, you need to control the input. Like traditional script-based approaches to this when you're trying to automate software, is it's the level of control. You know, something can happen on an endpoint, and all of a sudden, where you think something is going is going somewhere else, and something has spawned calc for some reason, and all the commands that you're trying to send are now sort of just hitting calculator, and it obviously doesn't know how to react to that. Um, and it requires, you know, when you look at things like Python, I'm a massive Python fanboy, but um, it requires dependencies that are you know, difficult to manage, particularly within Windows. So that wasn't a very, very flexible solution. And you know, PowerShell, as, as amazing as it is, wasn't really around in the, the XP days with the flexibility. So that, that wasn't really a solution. And you know, if you start thinking about the timings of stuff, maybe you want them to do specific things at specific times, it, it, it's a real um, problem to sort of manage that. So my solution was uh, Autoit. So I don't know if anybody you have heard of it before, but it's been around forever. Um, originally, it was conceived as a sort of a way to automate um, out-of-the-box experiences. And I realized this is perfect. This is exactly what I've been looking for, and I've been using it. So a couple of years ago, I started exploring the new capabilities of the tool. And it's, a basic, it's freeware, and it's a basic scripting-like language. 
Um, and it's amazing at controlling the Windows GUI. So you can interface with things at a class level. Um, it's really good at simulating keystrokes. So the nice thing about this is that you, know, you can actually key log because those keys are actually sent. Um, it's, it's really good. You can actually use it to control the mouse, etc. cetera. Um, sorry, this screen's flashing here, which is a bit of a distraction. So I'm just going to stop looking at that and just look at you instead. But the other thing is you can compile it to a single binary. So it gets rid of all of that sort of dependency hell um, in that you, you, know, you, you don't need something specific. What you end up with is a single binary which contains the runtime inside it. You can copy that anywhere. And um, that's it, basically. So I was like, this is perfect. This is the actual uh, the thing that I, I've been looking for. So off the back of that, I built a tool called Sheeple, which is uh, the premise of this talk. So we've had like interesting conversations internally about a sheeple and lots of sheeple. So it obviously follows this idea of sheep and herding sheep. But the idea is that you control, you orchestrate these tasks. Now, there's no AI in this, right? The sheeple aren't intelligent enough to make uh, decisions on their own. You program the tasks in that you, you provide to them. But there is some sort of, you can get quite clever with the logic as to how that works. So as a quick overview, so it's written in Python 3, and Python 3 is the front end uh, for all of this sort of stuff. And what it does is it generates valid Autoit language. One of the things that I didn't want to do was say, hey, everybody, I've written this new tool. Just go and learn this new language, and you'll be golden, because I think that that would be a barrier for entry. Um, as I said, I, I love Python. I think it's a very flexible language. I'm a self-taught developer, so it was the right entry point for me to be able to understand. Uh, and from that perspective, it, um, it, it's very flexible. So I sort of reflected on what it is to be a user, you know, what is normal user behavior or just user behavior, you know, malicious or otherwise. And I realized that there's this concept that, you know, we create tasks, we have tasks that we achieve in a day. So that could be a command shell interaction, we can create Word documents, et cetera. And as I said, it emulates keystrokes. So you know, when you're opening a command shell, you're actually typing commands, so I can use Autoit to simulate that sort of user behavior. And then you give them an amount of time to complete them. And um, it's very, very flexible in, in the timings. The, the Autoit runtime is solid. I've had Sheeple running for days um, in VMs. But you can specify hours, minutes, uh, days, et cetera, for this, this period of time. And then what it does is from the tasks that you've assigned it, it creates a random set of intervals from that. And that's really important. Um, you know, that was a big goal of mine for the tool was to have that entropy in there because, again, I don't want to be marking my own homework. I don't want to know when something is going to happen. I want to focus on my tradecraft development so that I can be waiting for that to happen or think about what could possibly happen next. Uh, and as I said, so you compile it into a single binary. Um, the comp there are compilation options as well, so you can reduce the file size by specifying a packer. Um, it has UPX built into it by default, but you can, if you're clever enough to write your own packer, you can specify um, your own packer to create whatever you want. Um, so that's very flexible, and it's quite small. Like if normally, um, it's about a meg, uh, and that's it. That's everything that you need. The runtime is already in there. All the tasks that you've assigned get folded into the output of the binary. Anything that you've asked them to type, letters, commands, that's all part of the binary as well. So you literally have this this, this binary that, that executes all the tasks that you've assigned it. So uh, I've got lots of video demos in a while, so you'll see that in context. So we released it as part of a 44Con talk with uh, Lawrence Monroe at um, 44Con. Uh, I've said that twice. Um, and it was well received. People really liked the concept. It was a beta uh, version of this. Um, but, you know, I realized that my approach was wrong. You know, there wasn't any sort of flexibility in how I wanted to drive things forwards. Um, when you're frustrated in the tool that you've written, in using it yourself, you realize that you probably need to go back. So after a bit of soul searching, I quickly released version two um, to address some sort of um, predictability issues in how the tasks get pushed. But um, essentially, I went back over October time. And over Christmas, I went right back to the beginning and rewrote the core. Because I don't want people to have to edit lots and lots of files and you know, uh, lots of changes here and there. That's what, how it was initially conceptualized, and that was becoming quite frustrating for me. So there's now two modes. There was always two modes, but there's now two proper modes in that the inter there's an interactive console. And you kind of build this up creatively. You create tasks, you assign them tasks, et cetera, and that's how it works. And then I've also recently folded in a JSON profile option so that you can um, 
build this as part of a pipeline. So this project was part of a larger project called LabSeed in that I was trying to automate that network map that I've shown you. Uh, and I've released two modules as part of that, one to create uh, massive amounts of users in Active Directory with passwords I don't know, and names that I don't know so that I can go and discover those users, again, with the premise of focusing on developing tradecraft rather than knowing the answers to what you've created. Uh, and Sheeple was a module in that as well, in that it's the same premise in, in sort of emulating that user behavior. And, and now, again, self-taught developer, but um, I took all the tasks and I applied some object-orientated programming to it. So I tried to make it so that all you essentially do is create your task and you can import that task in, and that's it. You don't need to necessarily um, make any other changes to the core of the program. Um, I've now created it so that you can import them dynamically as you're creating. Um, so that's quite nice. Um, before, there was lots of if-else checks if it's this, do this, if it's that, do that. And that was not flexible, particularly when you, I want these things to have hundreds, if not thousands of potential tasks. I've built a category system um, as to how they can, well, how can we can sort of uh, assign them. So that wasn't gonna work. So I'm using the CMD modules within Python and now each task can have its own little CLI, like Cisco-esque sort of console for that. And that can be commands that are specific to that task as you'll see in a while. Uh, and rather than saying, oh, here's a template that you copy from the repo and then, you know, make your changes, I've built a templating tool, I've built it into the tool itself. Mm -hmm. So when you've got an idea of creating a task, you can just create the template option and it will create you the stub code with all of the correct imports and all of the, the structure that follows the rest of the, um, uh, the, the process. And if you read through the code, I've, I've almost been sort of OCD about spacing and how things get delivered and moving stuff around because I think it's important for, for people to see that there's a lot of effort in trying to keep it clear, uh, hopefully because they want to make contributions. And then the one that drove me mad for, for quite a while and probably will continue to, but this idea that just because you write a task, it it should also be available somewhere else, specifically remote desktop. So I'll show you some remote desktop stuff in a while. But I felt, well, users don't just make a remote desktop connection to somewhere. Sure, if you're key logging, you can capture those authentication credentials. But sysadmins or attackers generally make GUI connections to something else to run something else. So this kind of, I, I fell into a bit of a rabbit hole as to how I could make subtasks available and, and how that would all work. And I'm pleased to say that I've got a, a stable solution to that. And it just uses Python 3.4 and up. So 3.4, I think, is about 2010. So you've got 10 years. I think that's, that's pretty fair. But the reason it's 3.4 and up is because I'm using the Pathlib library um, so that we can have it working on Windows, Mac, and Linux for the Python part of Sheeple. Um, that was really important to me. Um, I'm also just using the standard library, which is something I'm quite proud of. Um, probably having to rewrite much better modules, but that idea of not requiring anything other than Python 3.4 and above on Windows is, is quite important, particularly as it's a Windows orientated tool. So why is this even useful? You know, why would you care about this sort of stuff? Well, from a detection perspective, Let's say that you want to create log entries and you're trying to key off specific things. Um, Sheeple, that, that's great at that. The user interaction is there. So if, you're, if they're making a PS exec connection, for example, to something else, you will see that in the logs and there will be detections of activity. If you're using script block logging and stuff in, and transcript logging in PowerShell and upwards, everything that they type will be in the logs. So this gives us an opportunity to start replicating good or bad behavior depending on what the goal is of what we want to try and see. And Sheeple was released last week at RSA, so uh, I went to the madness of RSA and had a, had a good experience uh, and spent a lot of time talking about it. And some of the forensics guys were like, we're, we're going to use this or we are using this to create those artifacts on an endpoint because it's the same problem. It's a solved problem now, but it's the same problem in the sense that when they do it manually, they know when things have happened. So you've lost the learning objective, which is to discover what's actually happened. That's where the tradecraft development is, understanding what your workflow is in detecting this sort of stuff. So um, they, they like that idea of being able to discover what's actually happened. And because it's really good at how it deals with the time intervals, you don't end up with this consecutive 
uh, sequence of events, you can, depending on how you code them, you can have that spanning over a much wider time span. So um, very useful from that perspective. And from a red team perspective, you know, they're creating processes, as you'll see. So this gives you an opportunity to steal things, inject into things, key log things, just as we would in the real world. And it creates normal network traffic, normal noise. So again, goes back to the, you know, when you're trying to detect something, it's uh, a bit contrived if you're like, right, have you got your sensor? You've got your sensor. Everybody ready? Go. Did everybody catch that? High fives all round. We've got this APT thing down. But the reality of it is, like, when you're in a big network and you're getting thousands of events, you try and find that one anomaly that you're looking for. Or maybe you want to detect whether there's this very specific thing that you want to find within the noise. So you can create a sheeple, throw it out onto a training or a live network, have them execute that command, and then see whether you can find that within the network noise. So it gives you an opportunity to test some of this stuff that we should be looking at. So I coined this moments of opportunity. Um, I've said this a few times, but I think it's quite valuable because if you take the process injection or the key logging, for example, if you miss that, 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 say a user opens something, they authenticate to something, and you miss that credential capture, that could affect the overall outcome of the entire, the entire um, operation. Um, and the same thing from a blue team perspective. If there's a key, key element within a log that doesn't get reported back through for whatever reason, that could mean the difference between detecting a breach and not. So although these are simple concepts, they have uh, far-reaching uh, benefits. So lots of videos now to, uh, to take you through this. So the first one is the interactive mode. So this is running on Windows, because you, know, you can do that uh, with less pain. Um, so again, um, I'm using uh, CMD just because I, I like it as, a, as an option, but I've built in an option to be able to remove the color. So you open the console, and the first thing you do is you create a sheeple, and you have to create a sheeple to assign stuff. Then you define how long you want them to operate. For these examples, I've gone very uh, short time span. And then typing speed. And then you can list out all of the available things that are in there as tasks that you can assign to them. There's some help that you get for free with the CMD module, which is quite nice. And you can specify looping. And then once you've found a task that you want to assign, um, you go into that context. So you make a new in invocation of that task. Uh, in this case, give it a name for the file, um, what we want it to be called, and a location to, to save that content. Um, and this is pretty cool. This is properly replicating sort of user behavior. That can be a UNC path or anything that you want. So then you can specify a file that you want them to type. So in this case, I've just got some content, which is just a text file, and it will type, type that um, verbatim. And then you can complete that. And if you wanted to create a new one, you can, or then you kind of go into this task, new, back, task, new, back. So it's quite a nice way of working. Um, so for this one, for the command shell, we're just going to show that you've got slightly different options now, so it's context sensitive. Uh, it doesn't bomb out when you don't supply all of the credential, the correct things anymore, which is quite nice. You can see I'm terrible at typing, which I'll touch on in a while. And um, we're just going to start executing some normal C and D commands. Now, it's up to you what these commands are, depending on what you want to detect. Well, we're using net. You know, an APT number could be using could be using net for that. So you know, we're going to do some user enumeration here. I, you know, we're going to query the, the local administrative group, as uh, an APT groups do, et cetera, and the, the who am I command, so that we're discovering what our group access is, right? This is all sort of normal stuff that you would uh, see. And then there's an assign, so you can keep track of what you do. And I spend hours just sitting there typing out different scenarios for this sort of stuff, creating cheap or driving my wife mad all the time. So uh, PowerShell interaction is another useful one. So this is the same thing, but I've written extensions for, for this new version. One important one is the command file option. So you can import a text file with a sequence of commands inside it, and then it will basically execute whatever those commands are in there. And you can get very creative with the PowerShell pipeline. So this could be whatever you wanted. Um, in this case, I'm doing a bits transfer uh, of some malware from a server I've got sitting in the same network. But you know, that could be IEX download cradles, anything that you want to replicate and see whether it can be detected or not, as the case may be. So further down, you get some output, which is a .au3 file. Now, that's the AutoWit native language that it's created for you. It's counted the number of tasks that you have assigned. 
um, and then it will create some sort of random sleep times based on the total amount of time that you've, uh, you've given it um, to sort of go through as an array. And so you now take that, uh, so this, sorry, this is the output of the AU3 file, so this is native or to it. So you can see, like, you can hook in at the Windows API level, you, know, you get all these .au3 files for free as part of all to it. Um, I'm just creating an array of those commands that we've sent, an array of sleep times, and then to sort of solve the randomness of it all, um, on every, if, if you choose looping, on every iteration, it's going to choose a random sleep time and a random task. So that's really useful from my perspective because actually, if over a 10 minute period, I don't know, you know, first time round they could run command, they could run the command shell and wait for, you know, three minutes. And the second time round they could run PowerShell and wait for seven minutes. And that will just keep on going. And obviously, uh, the more tasks you have over a longer period of time, you know, the more sort of entropy you can build into that. There's some uh, console write functions. And what's interesting is you can see I'm using sleep quite a lot here, a native auto it declaration. I was reading yesterday that you can sleep for up to 24 days. So I think that's pretty powerful in that you can make sheeple that run over such a long period of time. I'm going to have to try that, where that there's maybe two or three um, invocations of tasks, and then run it over maybe three months and just see um, how that works. I'm sure it will be pretty stable. And this is an example of the Word document one that it's created. So this is all uh, native. You can see that it's activating the window. So that's really important. Traditional script-based approaches, as I said, you can lose your input. So in this case, it grabs that window title at the class level. And every time it needs to send input to that window, if it's not the active window, it steals it back. So that stops this sort of... Um, all my commands are going somewhere else because you, you grab it, you, you uh, instantiate it, you hook it, and then every time you need to interact with it, the system is clever enough to grab that back. So that sort of solves a lot of those where is my input going um, issue. Uh, and so this is just going to open up a Word file. It's gonna, I've, I've clipped some of it. It's going to type the stuff that we put in there, etc. And this is the output from the, uh, the command function. So you can see it's just sending all these commands in and sending enters and stuff, and it just gets passed through. So once you're done, you can compile the script. Um, you, you, you don't necessarily have to have auto it installed. There are portable versions. And I have had the au2exe file, which is the compiler for auto it. Um, I can, you can run that on Wine as well. So you don't necessarily have to have it installed. You don't necessarily have to run it on Windows. That's entirely up to you. There's probably the maximum amount of flexibility that we can get. Um, and I've got some ideas about how I could even automate that compilation process as part of the pipeline. But once you compile it, um, what you end up with is a, is, a, is a binary. So in this case, that's what we've got. It's a fairly small binary. And then we can just run it. Um, yeah, so this is just over a meg. Um, I've specified some options for the tray icon, so when it gets created, it's in the tray so that we know that it's running, but you can hide all this sort of stuff if you, if you don't necessarily want to see it. Um, and I find this a lot, so you, know, you kind of wait for things to happen, which is the purpose of the tool, um, and it's just going to start typing. So I've done some gimmicky stuff here, like the text files, the size is deliberately small, so that control A is through sheeple, they're selecting everything, and they're, if you keep an eye on the top, it's switching between heading and normal mode. So it's doing key combination presses to be able to emulate how the users um, are actually typing. Um, that's great from a sort of a perspective of like, making content and having content to attack, but also for that sort of real world feel for it all. So obviously anything that they type, you can, you can see, screenshots, key logging, et cetera, but you can also bring in those moments of opportunity to, if you're key logging, you can grab a credential because users never put credentials in like text files and stuff at all. That never happens. So you know, we, can, we can explore that as an idea. And as I said, you know, the fact that it's typing fairly fast, this is just the standard 40 milliseconds between key presses, um, but you, know, you can control that depending on how you want it. And they're particularly polite. Thank you very much. So that will save, that will cancel out. You know, you can see all this. It's now created that Crescon 19 Word file on the desktop um, for us, which is because that's where we specified to save it. And now we've got some content. So it's going to open up that command shell that we specified some commands for, and it's going to run through these enumeration commands, etc. I'll show you the process list in a while. Um, and you can just see this is all the stuff that we've typed before. Now, if you want to detect a malicious user potentially uh, performing enumeration techniques um, 
as per some of the MITRE stuff, define what your techniques are, add them in as a sheeple, get them to execute it, and see whether you can find that. So then we wait, <laughs> because that's the purpose. Now it's going to open up PowerShell, and we're going to get into some more sort of attacker focused really. So I'm just running get WMI on the, the services to enumerate which ones are running, and then we can start doing what could, could be considered malicious behavior. So in this instance, I'm importing the bits module, um, and now I'm going to create a bits transfer back from the web server that I'm on, and it's just called malware.exe. And you can see that that's been dropped on the desktop. But the point is now that that's triggered in a process on this is a Windows 10 machine, so Defender is now actually looking at that binary to go, hey, is this something that I'm allowed to or not, um, as the case may be. So that will be creating an alert locally, you know, and if you're doing things like Sysmon and event forwarding and, and Windows Defender logs, that will be triggered that a piece of malware has been dropped onto a system um, and therefore you know, it's been quarantined or deal dealt with. And the rest of it is just native sort of PowerShell stuff. Anything that you want to do in terms of test paths, et cetera, um, that's all there. So as you can see, like it's now just deleted. The system has deleted that malware that was dropped onto the desktop as a dropper, um, and that's left an event trail within the system. So this whole sort of concept of parent and child processes, um, it was really important to me to try and look at how the process tree is created in the context of a normal user, because I didn't want everything spawned as a child of Crescon. That's, that's not how it happens in the real world. And actually, if you look at EDR solutions, a lot of the time they are very interested in the process tree. They signature on that process tree. So it's quite important that as much as possible we look to see how we can replicate that. So this is um, a, a quick video of the previous one that I showed you. Uh, I've run it again just with Procmon running in the corner. Um, it's, I've just deliberately clop, crop, cropped out the stuff that we don't need to see, but this is the same command shells. And you can see it's invoked CMD as a child of Explorer, just in the same way that a user would do that. Um, and then any other commands that are spawned that are relevant to that process tree get spawned as a child of CMD. So you'll see in a minute, I believe, um, you have to wait, come on, uh, who am I? So we spawned who am I, and which is an invocation of another binary for a second. That process tree uh, is honored, and then it's uh, deleted. So that's really quite important uh, and very useful. So subtasks. Um, I, initially, I liked the idea of trying to make this work, and then the actual application of making this work drove me a little bit nuts. So I definitely fell into this uh, inception world where I had to put in additional checks. But um, I think I've got a pretty, pretty solid uh, solution to this now. So I'll just jump straight onto the video for, for time's um, sake. So I've, I, I haven't showed you how I've built the remote desktop task. I, I can you know, talk about that offline. But it's the same thing, you know, adding credentials, defining the tasks that are there. So this is just, um, I have a test network that I have on my Mac at all times. And this is just opening up a Microsoft um, remote desktop connection. And all these sorts of things, like uh, sending control O for options, uh, waiting for this window, this window security, um, hooking that title at a class level, uh, adding in his credentials, uh, dealing with this. So you know, this is quite interesting, because it's at IP level. It's trying to resolve the FTDN, which it doesn't. The certificate doesn't match. So you need the sheeple to recognize that that appears, and then they need to be able to spend that, send that uh, Alt Y key to be able to answer that question, um, which, when whenever you that was good timing, right? That was amazing. Um, I can't do that again. Um, so now we're in the the concept of a remote desktop connection, and now we want to start adding in other tasks. So for this one, I think I just open up uh, PowerShell and just run some um, sort of arbitrary commands. Again, you can you get a bit of a feel for the wait. I have doctored this a little bit for time's sake, but you can be waiting a long time for this sort of stuff. You don't know when it's going to happen. And the point about that is you, uh, when you do get something happen, you end up responding as you would in the real world with all that sort of urgency that you would in the real world, particularly if you catch your credentials. So it's just going to um, write the date and time to that uh, sheeple file that's on there um, on the desktop when it gets there. Uh, and what I've done is, at the moment, I've sort of half co hard-coded some randomness in, in between the actual time for executing the commands as well to make it even, even more sort of entropic, if that's even a word. Um, so we can get that, and you can see these are all the times that I'm frantically trying to get these videos together for, for today's presentation. 
And uh, I had um, a binary running on that system at the time, so I had a, a cobalt strike beacon. You can see that it also exits. So that was quite um, an experience, understanding how you can exit from a remote desktop session, because if you've ever done that, once it takes focus, it keeps focus. So I found that you can use the caps lock key locally, and if you, if you press the caps lock key locally, that breaks the focus for the remote desktop connection for uh, a small amount of time, so I can hook that, and then I can send the exit commands to that remote desktop session and exit out again. And when you're on loop, they'll just be opening that remote desktop connection, uh, opening up PowerShell, running through that process of tasks that have been assigned, and then coming back and exiting out again. So, as I said, I had that from a Cobalt Strike perspective, and this is what um, it's captured from key logging. You can see that we've captured all of the sort of the alt commands to send uh, the GUI controls, et cetera, uh, and we've actually got some credentials as well that we've captured in transit, so that's pretty good. So, we love MITRE. Um, you know, we contribute to MITRE at Spider Labs. Um, I think it's a really valuable um, way to sort of categorize types of attack, executions of attack. Um, I'm sure you will know about MITRE, so we'll, we'll skip that slide. But um, you know, this idea of defining a path through uh, a solution, potentially when you start reading through things like Atomic Red Canary, they give you examples of all of these types of things and how attackers are doing that, and then you can kind of draw a path through. Well, all of that's possible as replication using Sheeple. And as an example, um, the bits transfer that I ran is actually straight out of uh, the MITRE attack framework uh, 1197 technique for attackers using bits as a mechanism for getting files on and off a system. So, you know, we've just proven that that is one way that we can honor those sorts of tests. So, a couple of people were looking at this, and I'm involved in some projects where people are trying to use Sheeple in the real world for sort of assessment of various tools, etc. And they're having um, quite good levels of success, I'm, I'm pleased to say. I'm sure we'll be able to share some of those results as we move forward. But one of the first things that they said, uh, what somebody said to me was, well, I've tried to run it on Linux and it won't. I was, well, it's a Windows only tool. It hooks into the Windows API level. You know, it's, it can interface with COM. It can create memory regions, but it's a Windows specific tool. I started thinking, well, actually it would be pretty useful if you could control other entities. Like, how could I do that? So, and then I realized I'm probably overthinking it. Um, so I've written a uh, SSH module, basically, which is putty on the system, and so what this is going to do is it's going to open up a PuTTY connection over SSH to uh, the VIOS firewall router that I've got running on my local LAN. It's going to put the password in, um, and now sort of if, if you've ever used VIOS, this is just native VIOS commands, like I know what I need to type, so I just tell it to type it. So it's just listing all the interfaces, and I've deliberately left the descriptions um, out at the moment. But this is really powerful if you think about how you can use this, because you could essentially have a trigger, so let's say that there's all of a sudden you found malicious traffic um, that's coming from a specific location, maybe you've passed that out of Netstat, as an example, remotely. Um, you could then add firewall rules in that block that whole subnet at the edge level, not at the host level. You're now configuring a router, basically, using Sheeple. So um, it's a bit of a quirky example, but I realize that there's a lot of power there. Um, I mean, Packer does the same sort of thing if you've looked at DevOps. They're sending keystrokes to this sort of stuff. And as you can see, it's just updated all of that. But that could be anything in context. I think the firewall rules one is definitely um, an interesting one. Or from the attacking perspective, maybe you want to emulate a, sh a user logging into a solution and deleting logs, removing firewall um, entries, all that sort of stuff, um, which is exactly what they're doing now. It's a bit mesmerizing watching bots typing. So you can see that it's just added those interface descriptions in and then it's deleted them again. So that's cool, and I thought, yeah, so that opens up a lot of possibilities for anything SSH. But then somebody was saying to me, well, how do we make it red team? I was like, I don't, I don't think I've found a solution to automate red teaming. That's, I, I, I think that's a step too far. But um, the Windows subsystem for Linux might be something useful to, to explore. So I've written a, a bash task that I need to, to push. This is not in the repos yet, but, but it will be. Um, and on this Windows 10 machine, I've taken advantage of the, the Windows subsystem for Linux <coughs> installations. Um, so this is now like bash within Windows. Um, and the same things apply. You know, we can, we can work out what ID we are. We can like find out 
enumeration of a Linux system. From that perspective, SSH or otherwise, you know, anything that you can type normally um, within a console can be emulated. Um, and you can read files, create files in the context of that user. Uh, and when it gets there, if it gets there, you can do cool things like working out, well, what are my rights? Sending passwords, responding to the prompt. So I'm, in Windows, when you run bash, you, you end up with root permissions. So we can change to root, and then we can start doing things like working out, let's read the shadow file and start doing all of that sort of stuff. So we can emulate attackers that have access to Linux boxes using Windows <laughs> as, a, as a jump point, really, um, from that perspective. And again, you know, all of the factors for time still come into this because it's just a task that folds into the overall structure of the tool. So as a roadmap, um, drawing this to a close, um, so I've obviously got a lot more tasks to uh, create uh, and push. Um, I plan on sort of pushing some videos to show some of these concepts that I've spoken to you about today. Uh, there's a YouTube channel, uh, the Lab Seed YouTube channel, um, where I'm just going to kind of do a series of this sort of stuff. I find it much easier to be able to take specific parts and record videos about them. I, I, that's a medium that I prefer to work in. So that's definitely on the cards. You know, if you uh, if you keep an eye on that Labseed YouTube channel um, for the next couple of weeks, you'll start seeing content appearing there. Uh, and then this concept of traits. So I started reflecting on well, at the moment. It, it's still, there's still a lot of uh, deterministic behavior in that. You know, if you assign a, a sheeple an Excel spreadsheet, you know, open an Excel spreadsheet, create an Excel spreadsheet, and let's say you want to test whether something will be um, uh, detected like enable macros, because you can send the, the, uh, the keystrokes, the mouse movements for that, um, every, sheeple will like, every sheeple will do that, and that's not the real world. What about if you create a couple, or even document specific, let's say you, take, you create 10 documents, and on one of those documents, you want somebody to enable macros, and on everything else, you want them to, to ignore that. So this concept of traits, uh, I'm going to fold that into the tool so that you can even further personalize behaviors um, for these sort of end users um, from that perspective. And then there's typing ability. So as you saw, I'm not the world's strongest typer. Uh, and I realized that um, that's actually representative of the real world. You saw in the, the output from the key logging with the remote desktop connection, it's a pure capture. You get every single keystroke, and that's not representative of the real world. So this ability to backspace and make mistakes and then deal with those mistakes um, when they're typing is quite important. So there's a bit of work to do there. I've already got the concept ready. Um, I'm not going to push a 1,000 tasks and then try and implement that in afterwards. That would be quite um, labor intensive, so I'm going to do that fairly soon. But I like this idea of you can have a PA that can type at 140 words a minute and very rarely makes mistakes, all the way down to like a chicken pecker that takes like three weeks to type a letter. I mean, that's very representative of the real world. And then this stupid idea of uh, my own specific language that uh, I came up with yesterday, following the sheep theme called Woolpack, which is basically Markdown, but it, it made me laugh. That idea of when you're creating a Word document, it will just take a text file and it will, you know, how do we apply the formatting or other things like maybe you want them to copy and paste something to the clipboard and if you're watching the clipboard, you can capture that. Uh, you know, all this sort of stuff, like this is real world attack, real world defense. So how can I build that in, in a way that doesn't require that you have to edit lots of things afterwards? So I'm going to use that sort of a style to have Woolpack specific transforms for things that will work through that. And then the final thing is extending the web interface. So uh, there already is an uh, Internet Explorer task in there, so they can open up Internet Explorer and browse to other locations. It would be nice to um, extend that to other browsers. Also, it has a principle of UDFs, so they're user-defined functions, so you can build your own libraries. I'm not using any of them yet, but there are some amazing libraries out there, which I'm definitely going to be using, so I'll build that into the tool so that people can sort of br bring in other functionality. But I like the idea of extending it so that they can authenticate to web services, so that you have session cookies to, to potentially steal or otherwise, and, and it's much more sort of real world from that perspective. Or perhaps go to a pastebin site, grab some malicious code, capture all that code, bring it back, open up Notepad, paste it into Notepad, save it as a C-sharp source file, and then use a command shell invocation to use the C-sharp compiler within Windows to create your own binary on the fly, as attackers do in the real world. 
So the tool is available on our Spider Labs uh, GitHub repo. Thank you very much for the opportunity to harp on about uh, SQL.